Do you need to find the skills to How would you tell people that this person? You first, first, first. How would you tell this Well, I don't know. 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 Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Before we start, I want to give a special thank you to my patron Nebulon for making this amazing fan art featuring myself, Ben Tovind, Gutsa Gibbon, and Maddie from Science Side Up. Anyway, last time we were here, we were talking about the Cambrian and how all the phyla just suddenly showed up without any earlier antecedents in the Eddie Akarin, except, you know, that there are such antecedents, and that phylum is just another made-up rank-like family, and we have stem members of phyla, which we wouldn't expect if phyla were simply created by God de novo in the Cambrian. We're going to start off continuing that discussion, so here's Steve. This is a guy called Anomalocaris. He is the, uh, he was the, the, the top of the food chain predator in the Cambrian Seas, about a meter long, extraordinary, and the preservation of the, the, the body parts and tissues that was another arthropod. Except no, we have another stem arthropod. In this case, a whole group of them called radiodonts. Weird how if each phylum is a unique creation, we keep finding things that are almost members, but not quite. One of the ways you can tell that this guy wasn't an arthropod is that the name arthropod literally means jointed legs, because that's a characteristic of the group. And what didn't radiodonts have? Right, jointed legs. Weird how that works, isn't it? Extraordinary creature. Um, another animal that was discovered if, uh, representing the phylum Hyolitha. Weird how both Hyolitha and Brachiopods, which are still alive today, are both Brachiozoans. So do they have the same body plan, or is this more evidence of the emergence of the brachiopod from within a wider spiralian group of organisms? Hard to say, except yet again, Meyer is presenting animals that, rather than being a problem for the idea of common ancestry at higher levels than the phylum, are in fact evidence of it. This hyolith uh, was a, a, an animal that lived inside a conical shell that had an attached lid that opened and shut. Uh, another interesting body plan. But that body plan is a top and a bottom shell with lophophores. So is that the same body plan as a brachiopod or bryozoan? Why or why not? It's not a member of either phylum, yet it has this common structure. Weird, it's almost like evolution happened within brachiozoa, at levels above the phylum. Uh, different kinds of worms, a foronited worm that had uh, a feeding organ and a thing called a lophophore. I mean, really? Well, we just went over lophotrochozoa, a super phylum, it's like Meyer is just doing my job for me. A worm inside a tube, the worm lived inside the tube, but then another kind of worm, an annelid worm that was segmented and had lateral bristles for locomotion. So yet more variation on Lophotrochozoa, again, a superphylum. Weird how much diversity there is around phyla before we even get to the diversity within phyla. So lots of distinct body plans and architectures. If by distinct you mean falling into a nested hierarchy of the same kind that Meyer accepts lower in the taxonomic tree as indicating common descent, then sure. Although that's not how I would use the word distinct. Exemplified by these different animals. Um, this guy I really like, it looks kind of like a plant, but uh, the more they studied it, the more convinced they were the paleontologist that it was an animal. Yup, and given its rarity and the small size, it's a bit of a mystery what it is. Although it wasn't first discovered in China like Meyer implied, but in the Burgess Shale. It's just that now the majority of specimens are from China. I'm not sure how that matters, and I'm also not sure what the existence of enigmatic fossils is supposed to mean for his point. But the, the organization of this animal, called Dynamiscus, was so unusual, they didn't quite know how to classify it, so they just called it a problematica. In fact, its affinity is still problematic. Like, you know that was the case for most Cambrian animals when they were first discovered. It's almost like that's how science works. It starts out not claiming undue certainty, and then when there are open questions, it seeks new data to try to come up with the best explanation possible. Unfortunately, when it comes to Dinomiscus, we have very little to go on. It's not an invitation to invalidate all the things we know, though. You can see, ladies and gentlemen, how science works. Um... Cautiously, openly, and honestly, if I'm basing it on this example. I really hate how much creationists treat scientific caution and reserve language as if that means the whole enterprise were in question. It is the very caution, humility, and willingness to be shown to be wrong that makes science the powerhouse that it is in terms of explaining the natural world. Only by being honest about what we do and do not know, how well we know it, and how we could be shown to be wrong, as well as the willingness to see if we are wrong, and accept it if we are, has science managed to get past any wrong answer it might have gotten in the past. It is why we can trust science. 
Anyone who comes to you claiming certain knowledge that can never be challenged, even in principle, about the natural world is someone you should steer clear from. And creationists often fit that description. Okay, so uh, that's very, that was kind of neat. So we were getting a really good fossil uh, show. Oh, and this, this guy's my favorite, because we have these in the Puget Sound where I live, near Seattle. And this is extraordinary. This is a, 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 a comb jelly. And the, you can see, um, the, let's see, the picture on the left is a photograph of a modern translucent comb jelly. And the picture on the right is the artist's depiction of what's being shown by that Cambrian era fossil. So on the standard geological time scale, this guy's been around for 520 to 30 million years, and he hasn't, he hasn't evolved at all. This is a phenomenon that paleontologists now call stasis. How do we know it hasn't evolved? Do you have a complete genome and anatomical description of Motianoscus octanarius in your back pocket, Steve? I didn't think so. Anyone can point to a morphologically conservative organism in the modern day and look at an earlier form and say, hurt to her, where to evolution do? Guess what? Doesn't mean there was none. But just looking at this, I see differences in the bell and mantle shape, as well as a difference in the pairing of cilia tracts. So I guess that's where it is. Which is a lack of directional evolutionary change. Organisms well adapted to persistently stable niches not undergoing large morphological change is an actual prediction of evolution. The fact that stabilizing selection is a thing isn't a problem for evolution, it's a prediction of it. It's like pointing out that Pontius Pilate was a real person and saying that's a problem for the Bible. Even though you'd expect him to be real based on the fact the Bible talks about him as the Roman governor who sentenced Jesus to crucifixion. Things just stay the same for a long period of time. Kind of mysterious on a Darwinian point of view. Nope, not if you're well adapted to your niche such that significant morphological changes away from your current form are always maladaptive. Then it is perfectly in line with evolution, although Darwin has nothing to do with it. After this is more anecdote about Professor Chen and how he supposedly questioned evolution, I have no way to verify any of this. So I feel like it's not worth responding to. Additionally, it's not what some guy in some lecture hall says. It's about what's in the literature. And that does not in any way support Meyer's position. Meyer also talks a bit about early chordates. He doesn't make any new points. And at a certain point in his talk, he said, you know what's extraordinary about these fossil forms? And he held up his hand like this and he said, is they turn Darwin's tree of life upside down. So now in the Darwinian tree of life, uh, the little changes uh, accumulate over long periods of time, uh, uh, eventually resulting in big disparities in form. You mean how lots of things are just kind of vaguely worm-like in the Cambrian, then stem groups like stem arthropods and stem mollusks arise being more distinct, and now the members of the phyla that they represent are even more diverse and distinct than their stem group ancestors? Yeah, go on. Uh, a, a chordate is really different than an arthropod. That's a completely different body organization. But it's not completely different from a hemichordate or urochordate. It's only a bit different. Um, theoretically, from a Darwinian point of view, those two forms of animal life would have had a common ancestor way, way, way back. Yeah, the first bilaterian animal. But guess what? We have a fossil that matches what we would expect of such an organism. Icaria wariutia, from about 550 million years ago. You know, about 15 to 20 million years before the Cambrian. Such explosion. Much boom. Wow. So it takes a long time to develop those big differences, and they only arise at the end of a long process of gradual evolutionary change. Well, given that the difference between phyla is, as we have seen, not as distinct as Meyer would like to pretend, and that we have tens of millions of years at minimum to work with before even getting to the Cambrian, seems fine to me. In the Darwinian theoretical perspective. I swear, I should start a drinking game where I drink each time a pseudoscience enjoyer uses the name Darwin for no reason. After this, he just said that Dr. Chen agrees with him, and haha, censorship in China doesn't censor him from saying stuff about evolution or lack thereof. I don't care about that. I don't think that the exchange actually happened as Meyer presents it, so I'm skipping it. Uh, in any, oh yeah, I love this guy. This is this, the, one of the earliest fishes ever discovered in the Cambrian, right from the very beginning. It's only from the beginning of the Cambrian, if by that you mean more than 20 million years into it, and having been preceded by more basal chordates and being surrounded by almost, but not quite chordates, then sure. Now, even as ardent an advocate of evolutionary orthodoxy as Richard Dawkins... I'm not defending a 1986 Dawkins quote that's taken out of context. Do better, Meyer. Cite some research that's actually peer-reviewed and not ancient. Basically, Dawkins was talking about gaps in the fossil record, some of which have been filled, in the context of the then hotly contested arguments over punctuationism and gradualism. 
since everyone agrees that there are gaps in the fossil record, and since they are not per se a problem for evolution, and since they are fewer and fewer, I really see no reason to engage this. By, by, now, by the time 1984 and the 1990s and right up to the present, there are very few paleontologists who any longer think we haven't looked hard enough for the ancestors in the Precambrian. Really? Because I just mentioned, and linked in the description, a paper about the discovery of an organism from the Precambrian that looks an awful lot like what we'd expect for the ancestor of all bilaterian life. That's like 33 phyla or something. Seems like more looking has indeed paid off. Um, but up until relatively recently, there were still a lot of people who thought, well, maybe we're missing the ancestors simply because they weren't preserved. And the, and the most popular version of the artifact hypothesis was that they weren't preserved because the, um, the, the, the ancestors were too small or too soft. And we're back to the rotifer problem from last time. Explain why we don't have fossil rotifers until the Eocene, but evolution needs all the ancestors of all phyla to be found in a smooth transition in the fossil record with the same explanation, without special pleading, Steve, or it's time to GTFO. But the Chinese fossils revealed something relevant to that claim as well. And that was a, uh, a really interesting find um, in a layer of um, rock just beneath the layers that document the Cambrian explosion. Oh, good to know that Meyer knows that the Cambrian isn't the dawn of animal life. Weird then how we'd lie about that when talking about trilobite eyes earlier. It's almost like he doesn't care about actually being honest, just scoring rhetorical points. Next thing you know, we'll have to dress him up in a Superman outfit and give him a bad haircut. This is a layer called the Dushantu Shale, and in this shale, it's a very late Precambrian sedimentary layer, the Chinese paleontologists have discovered little tiny microscopic fossils going through the first few cell divisions. They're embryos. Of course, when he says they're late Precambrian, he is being a bit misleading. Many of my readers are familiar with the mistaken point biota, which is what most people think of when they think of eddy-occurrent life, organisms like Spergina, Charnia, and Dickinsonia. Well, this formation predates even that, which may at least in part explain why all the fossils are microscopic. It may be that this predates even the evolution of macroscopic scale animals. Of course, we're still looking at about 300 million years of animal evolution between the earliest animal fossils and this assemblage. It has also been proposed that given the unusually consistent size of the fossils, which is extremely unexpected, that there may have been some taphonomic process that prevented larger or even smaller fossils. Because remember, we're also not finding smaller bacteria fossils. Or at least none have been reported that I can find. And similarly, while there are microscopic sponges and corals, none are even approaching the size that we find at mistaken point, which seems hard to explain without some mechanism keeping larger organisms out of the fossil-bearing rock, even under Meyer's ideas. And of course, all of this is assuming that they are in fact animal embryos, which itself isn't completely agreed on. Probably of sponges, a very simple animal form, one of the few animal forms that originated in the late Precambrian. Well, except we also have Nidarians from the Duchantu shale, and that's quite a bit more complicated than a sponge. Also, while this is disputed, there have been reports of potential bilaterian embryos and even microscopic adults. That is something I bet he doesn't bother reporting on since it would throw a monkey wrench into his point of, see this one fossil site doesn't have the ancestors of various modern phyla, therefore no such thing exists. Which is already an obviously bad argument. And one of the reasons I'm pointing out all the contentions around the forms found in the Duchantu shale is that it's actually not well established what's being found in this rock. Basing our picture of the time before the mistaken point adiacarin biota evolved on the basis of this is at best premature. It is already difficult to interpret, and independent of any Meyer nonsense, there is good reason to believe we do not have a clear picture of the taphonomy of the location. Now, this discovery raises a huge problem it, it, it produces it, it, uh, for, the, for the artifact hypothesis. And it's this, if the late Precambrian sediments are capable of preserving small microscopic fossils, but not the larger fossils, which apparently they can't, even though there's every reason to think those tiny embryos grew into larger animals, in at least some cases, which are not preserved. First, probably the same reason they tended not to preserve the adults of the embryos we find. And second, the Precambrian rocks probably did to some extent, you know, over in Canada. Why didn't they preserve the ancestors to all the other animals that first arise in the Cambrian? The fishes, the, the trilobites, the animalocarids, the, all these other guys. Chordates do in fact have pretty obscure origins, but there are potential panarthropods in the Ediacaran, just, you know, not in the Duchantu shale. It must be so much easier to be a pseudoscientist hack 
where you get to just ignore most of the evidence and cherry pick, misinterpret what you did cherry pick, and then make a bit more up, and your audience just laps it up because you're not one of those evil materialists. Even though many of the people who are actually doing the real work of science are also not philosophical materialists. Especially since most of them would have had to have some at least hard parts because they're animals with hard XO or internal skeletons. Well, that's just a <laughs> lie. Hard parts, that is mineralized parts, aren't ancestral to bilaterians and don't appear until well down the tree somewhere past superphylum. And even within organisms that he's shown as examples of modern phyla with hard parts, we've seen things that didn't have bones or other mineralized parts. Like his early fish, or morella, which had a chitinous but not mineralized exoskeleton. Even with the phyla that probably do have hard parts as the ancestral form, such as Brachiopoda and Mollusca, we can see other members of the superphyla that lack such structures, some of which Meyer even showed us. So now, the, I, I would say the dominant view in Cambrian paleontology, especially among the leading experts on the explosion, is that the explosion is real. Well, yeah, it's what you call the tens of millions of years long radiation of hard bodied organisms during the Cambrian period. That was never in dispute. No one ever said, nah, nothing significant happened in the Cambrian. The question is, can it be well explained by current ideas in evolutionary biology? And the answer is yes. Something big happens every time there is a major radiation of any organisms, but adaptive radiations are part of the evolutionary theory, not a problem for it. It's not an artifact of incomplete sampling or, in, or an incomplete fossil record. Funny then that the example we are shown to demonstrate that can't really be well explained without that, and that Meyer has yet to actually argue for the idea that the fossil record is substantially complete in terms of both geologic and temporal extent, such that we should not expect to be missing any species which have existed. Which is basically what he needs to do to be able to say that we should expect known fossils representing the evolution of all phyla. There was a very important book on the Cambrian explosion that came out in 2013, the same year as mine, by James Valentine and Doug Irwin. And they basically, they're certain, no friend of my preferred perspective, which I'll expl explain later, but they very much uh, think that the Cambrian event was real, and what, what, however, whatever we make of it, they argue, we've got to reckon on the explosion as being something that, that really happened. It's not just an artifact of incomplete sampling or incomplete preservation. Yeah, no one is saying it didn't happen. That's a mighty fine straw man you got there, Steve. Now that's, so that's the first, the first mystery of... Uh, that I address in the book. The mystery of why new niches result in adaptive radiation isn't really a mystery. So let's go into this a bit. Adaptive radiations are related to niche partitioning, and so I'll start with that. Niche partitioning is what happens when you have more than one population competing for the same bundle of resources. So let's say you have two kinds of squirrels who are both eating chestnuts and acorns. Let's say the brown squirrels are, for whatever reason, a bit better adapted to get chestnuts, and the red squirrels a bit better at getting acorns. The exact details of why is not important. All that's important is that this difference exists, and it is for reasons that can vary as genetics vary. Now, they both compete with each other for both kinds of nut, making life harder for both populations. But the brown squirrels have to compete less for chestnuts and the red less for acorns. So any variations that make the brown squirrels even better at exploiting chestnuts, or the red squirrels even better at exploiting acorns, will be on the whole more likely a bigger advantage than variations that do the opposite. As a result, over time, the red and brown squirrels will tend to compete less and focus more on the food that they are now beginning to specialize in. In the long run, if the environment is sufficiently stable, they will likely end up eating their preferred food almost exclusively and essentially eliminating any interspecies competition between them. Now, let's look at something similar in the real world. About 150 years ago, the hawthorn maggot in North America found that the relatively newly introduced domesticated apple was a good host for its young. Before this, the fly larvae had specialized in parasitizing the hawthorn berry, hence the name. But a whole new niche became available. Those flies that could lay eggs on apples suddenly found that they were no longer in competition for hawthorn berries, and so reproduction became easier for them. But still, there were flies that were either not very good at using apples, or simply not inclined to use apples, and so they stuck to the hawthorn berries. Now at this point, the two populations no longer interbreed because as time has gone, the apple maggots, as they are now called, became specialized and so they timed their breeding to the seasonal cycle of apples, not hawthorn berries, which is sufficiently different that the two populations simply breed at different times. These populations have essentially speciated, and one segment of the original ancestral common hawthorn maggot population has filled a niche that didn't even exist not that long ago. These are small-scale examples of how niche partitioning, along with the advent of new niches to fill, can cause species to multiply. Now, niches can become available in two big ways. The first is that a new resource is suddenly available to organisms, such as in the apples in North America. The other is that previous occupants of a niche go extinct. 
For example, if the current apple maggot population were driven to extinction, perhaps by humans, it is likely that in a few hundred years some new population of insects would begin parasitizing apples, simply because that's an energy source and lifestyle no one else is going for, and so they would be largely free of competition. So what happened in the Cambrian? Well, remember, to exploit a new niche, an organism must be capable of at least poorly occupying a niche. And the Cambrian largely represents the beginning of mineralization of body parts, which allowed organisms to become bigger and more active on the whole. This opened up the possibility of active predation rather than just rooting around in the muck or suspension feeding. But active predation is often best avoided by active organisms, which thus resulted in harder, bigger, more active, and perhaps even smarter prey. But also, being more active allows for more complex behavior, such as migration, creating burrows, even social interactions. Suddenly, because of the advent of mineralization, there were all new niches opening up all over the planet, and an evolutionary arms race between predator and prey was set off heavily favoring organisms to either get fast, get armored, or in some cases, both. At this point, morphologically speaking, evolution was off to the races. There was now a reason to evolve efficient fins, legs, eyes, armor, skeletons, claws, spikes, you name it. That's what the Cambrian was. It wasn't magic, but it also wasn't a non-event. But neither was it instantaneous, as Meyer is implying. The second one has to do with um, what, what, what you really can think of as, first of all, it's a deeper problem, and it's an engineering problem. It's the question of how would the evolutionary process build all this new form and structure? By co-opting the already existing regulatory architecture. For example, the regulatory genes that govern limb, eye, gut, and segment development in panarthropods is the same, but it's also the same in chordates like you. You use the same regulatory genes as a fly does to grow an eye or a leg. In the ancestral bilaterian, these genes were probably not being used for the exact same purpose, but ultimately these developmental genes are the genes that tell embryonic tissues to fold, grow, die, or differentiate. And that's essentially all that happens in an embryo. Just doing these things in different amounts at different points and at different times. The potential for a simple tube within a tube worm to become any of the phyla that we now see is already there, just waiting for mutations to occur to make their development follow more complex paths. This is no longer a mystery. Evolutionary biologists know how this happened, and in some cases can even identify the mutations that had to occur to get the various body plans from the basic bilaterian ancestor. Especially in such a short period of time, geologically speaking, and biologically speaking. I don't think a few tens of millions of years is such a short time, and Meyer hasn't even begun to argue that it is. He's just asserted it. The natural selection random mutation mechanism needs a long time to work. In most cases, it needs at least a few tens of thousands of years to get serious morphological change done. But, you know, we have a few tens of millions of years, and there are cases where it can happen faster, such as in environments conducive to punctuated equilibrium, where small populations can evolve much faster because genetic drift is less likely to eliminate new variation just because of the law of averages. And scientists can actually, uh, there's a branch of evolutionary biology that allows scientists to actually calculate what are called waiting times. By this, he's mostly referring to creationist nonsense, but we'll see where he goes with it. If you know the size of a population, the mutation rate, the time from one generation to the next, factors like that, you can calculate for any given uh, set, a series of mutations how long you should have to expect for such an event to take place. No, not from those variables. The mutation rate doesn't matter, and oddly enough, neither does the generation time. What you actually need is the phylogenetic replacement rate, because that already factors into it the loss of mutations from things like failure to reproduce, genetic drift, and the difference between somatic and germline mutations, which the mutation rate does not do. And you also get to factor out the generation time. But you'll need the crossover rate, because mutations in separate lineages can become linked during chromosome crossover in meiosis. At this point, it's probably worth it to discuss crossover. This is something that happens during meiosis, which is the process by which germline cells produce gametes. So for humans, that would be sperm or egg cells. As you probably already know, humans are diploid creatures, meaning that they have two copies of each chromosome, with the possible exception of chromosomal abnormality, which leads to sterility, or sex chromosomes, which may not be able to pair up if an individual has an X and a Y chromosome. When two of the same chromosomes line up in this case, on average, each one swaps part of itself with its twin so that the alleles on one chromosome cross over with the other and vice versa. This helps break up what are called linkage blocks, that is whole sets of genes that are associated with each other and tend to be inherited as a group. This is what prevents most chromosomes from simply being completely independently evolving lineages that must be taken or left as a whole, which is the case for mitochondrial and Y chromosome DNA, which is why those are easier to trace the ancestry of, but also why problems with them are harder to overcome if they are the cause of genetic disease. 
Now, if you take the factors that are actually relevant, rather than ones chosen to give inaccurate results, but results that are convenient for creationism, then yes, you can calculate about how long you should have to wait to see a series of mutations on average. But of course, the reason creationists use the wrong factors is that it gives them the wrong answer, but an answer that, if correct, would make evolution using mutation as a source for new raw material on which other mechanisms can act implausible. And the thing is that a lot of the creationists who do this know better. They know they're getting absurd results that don't actually map onto known behavior of real populations. They just don't care. Further, this idea directly contradicts the idea of created heterozygosity, in which God has maximally diverse organisms on the Ark, and then subsequent diversity is driven primarily by crossover events, shuffling this pre-existing diversity up. This would have to make the crossover events extremely likely, but the waiting time problem depends so heavily on it being so rare that they tend to pretend that it doesn't happen at all. So on the one hand, creationists need crossovers all over the place to get modern diversity, but also need them to be vanishingly rare so that mutation seems an implausible mechanism to generate biodiversity. The waiting time problem, as described by creationists, also falls into the trap of thinking that evolution must proceed linearly toward predefined goals. So they will calculate how long it will take for a specific sequence of mutations to occur and fix one after the other. So if they need mutations A, B, and C, they will assume that only after A occurs and reaches fixation should they expect B. But this is simply not how evolution works. There may be many sequences of mutations that can result in the same benefit. We can see this work in modern organisms who have the same morphological adaptation but different genetic causes. For example, human populations in both Europe and Eastern Asia tend to have pale skin, but for different genetic reasons. Also, Mexican cave fish are all blind, but for different reasons genetically, such that hybrids from different cave populations end up having functioning eyes, because with different eye genes broken in different populations, the cross between them ends up with a full set of functional genes for eyes. Further, the required mutations can occur in separate lineages at any time and can even combine due to crossover before reaching fixation. So creationists are using a series of assumptions we know to be false, then using the wrong parameters and getting results that they set out to get in the first place. This is not how science works. And there's a reason that real geneticists and evolutionary biologists don't even normally bother engaging with creationists. It's the same reason that real law enforcement doesn't bother looking into what kids playing cops and robbers are doing. But we're going to save the rest of our discussion about genetics and how it is in no way a problem for evolution for next time. Thank you for watching this far if you did. If you liked this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, give it a dislike and tell me what you didn't like in the comments. Either way, please do remember to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, and turn on all notifications. It really helps. Also, share this video if you know anyone who would like to see it. As always, there are links in the description to sources, and I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Work in Progress, Bent Hovind, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Chris Love, Landon Noel, Yepetus, Mabity Babity, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month, my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting, so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to it exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if the annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching. How are we